Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Beijing. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. So, hello everybody. It's a pleasure now to welcome you all to the Medscape Oncology Global program called B-cell malignancies, why not all BTK inhibitors are created equal. And I'm more than happy to introduce you to section one with the key questions, why more BTK inhibitors are needed for B-cell malignancies. So my name is Christian Buske. I'm a medical director at the University Hospital Ulm in Germany, uh, heading also the Institute of Experimental Cancer Research. So let's start with the first generation BTK inhibitor, Ibotinib. So what do we know? Ibotinib is a small molecule drug that binds covalently to BTK and has been proven to be very effective uh, in the treatment for various B-cell malignancies. So it was initially approved eight years ago by the FDA in the year 2013, and it's now approved for treating relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic lymphoma, uh, leukemia, sorry, SLL, Weinstrom's macroglobulinemia, and relapsed refractory Martian zone lymphoma. It was approved one year later by the EMA in the year 2014 and approved for treating relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and violence from macroglobulinemia. However, what we have learned is that ibotinib has toxicities, probably based on its off-target activities of non-BTK kinases that are related to side effects and which actually translate into some clinical limitations. Also, resistance to ibrutinib has recurrently been reported. So based uh, on this, I think it's very interesting to, to look into this, uh, to look at uh, second or next generation BTK inhibitors in this program. And let's start first with zanobrutinib. It's a more selective BTK inhibitor with a higher specificity for BTK over non-BTK kinases than ibrutinib. It's also already approved by the FDA in August 2021 for the treatment of relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma and Weinstrom's macroglobulinemia. And in September this year, EMA recommended market authorization for treatment of Weinstrom's macroglobulinemia. There are very interesting data uh, based on head to head studies with ibotinib available. First, to mention the ESPEN trial, which compared zanobrutinib head to head to ibotinib and symptomatic violence from macroglobulinemia, And the result was that zanobrutinib was non-inferior to ibotinib and showed a trend towards less toxicity, particularly cardiac toxicity. And we have to mention the Alpine trial. It's again a head to head comparison between zanobrutinib and ibotinib, uh, this time in relapsed refractory chronic lymphocytic leukemia or SLL. Also in this study, zanobrutinib was non-inferior to ibotinib with improvements in response and should also reduce toxicity, including reduced rates of atrial fibrillation or flutter. So the other next generation BTK inhibitor we have to mention is Acalabotin. This BTK inhibitor with improved selectivity for BTK and off-target side effects compared to Ibotinib was first approved by the FDA in 2017. And it's now approved for treatment of relapse refractory mental cell lymphoma and CLL-SLL. It was approved uh, three years later by the EMA in 2020 for the treatment of CLL. And also here, we have data from a head-to-head -head study with ibotinib to mention the Elevate RR uh, trial, which compared acalabotinib versus ibotinib in previous treated CLL. And in this study, uh, acalabotinib was also non-inferior to ibotinib and had few, fewer cardiac toxicities with atrial fibrillation events and discontinuations due to adverse events. So uh, last but not least, we have to mention the BTK inhibitor tirabotinib. Again, it's a highly selective inhibitor of BTK, so the data are still more limited compared to 
The other two next generation BTK inhibitors, but it's already approved in Japan in the year 2020 for the treatment of CNS lymphoma, Weisenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma based on clinical data. So this was just an introduction into uh, our program, which will follow after this section first. So the goal of our learning program is uh, to explain to you some of the key differentiating factors between first and next generation BTK inhibitors for B-cell malignancies with the question, do we really need next generation or second generation BTK inhibitors? What are the advantages for further developments? In this segment, the following segments of this activity will cover these important aspects as uh, listed here. So the mechanistic differences between first and next generation BTK inhibitors, the impact of, of target effects on the side effect profile of these next generation BTK inhibitors, the efficacy data comparing first versus next generation BTK inhibitors, and the key safety profiles uh, again, comparing first versus next generation BTK inhibitors. And I think very important for our daily clinical life, differences in dosing, modifications, drug to drug interactions, and patient reported outcomes. With this, I want to, uh, to um, finish now uh, the section one, and we will move now uh, to section two. Thanks a lot. Hi, in this segment, uh, I will be talking about the case for mechanisms of actions associated with current as well as next generation BTK inhibitors. My name is Steve Trion. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the Bing Center for Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, it's important to keep in mind that both PK pharmacokinetics as well as PD pharmacodynamics can actually impact BTK inhibitors. There are differences in the pharmacokinetics of BTK inhibitors that may influence the dosage, efficiency, as well as adverse events in clinical practice. Pharmacodynamics can also differentially affect target inhibition, as well as potential for off-target interactions. And also non-BTK targets can impact the activity as well as toxicity of BTK inhibitors. Now, when one looks at the potency of first and next generation BTK inhibitors, it's important to recognize differences that exist in both the inhibitory constants as well as rates of enzyme inactivation. And these days, particularly looking at the constant of inactivation over the inhibition constant, the so-called K inact over KI, may be particularly illuminating, more so than maybe IC50s, because this takes into account the rate of constant efficiency of the covalent bond itself. And you can see these differences exist when one looks at ibrutinib as well as zanubrutinib, for instance, that have a lower um, uh, concentration uh, for this constant uh, compared to drugs like acalabrutinib and atirabrutinib. Now, in addition, the pharmacokinetics of first and next generation BTK inhibitors is also important. And one has to keep in mind that there are a lot of um, variables in the PK dynamics that one needs to keep in, into mind, such as the Cmax, what's the highest concentration that the drug uh, can actually achieve uh, when administered uh, to um, in, in vitro setting. And this is also important to keep in mind that the Tmax uh, the half-life of the drug is equally important, as is the area under the curve. This uh, will, you know, keep in mind because, you know, the higher AUCs, as we see here with drugs like acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib, and maybe even more so with tirabrutinib, may in fact allow for a higher concentration of drug in order to be able to inhibit um, various um, uh, off-target effects, but on the other hand, uh, may be beneficial in terms of BTK inhibition itself. The half-life is also important. Uh, there are differences, as one can see here, with higher half-lives for ibrutinib as well as anubrutinib versus acalabrutinib. This is important to keep in mind because this impacts uh, daily dosing uh, parameters. And then lastly, I think it's also important to keep in mind the clearance dynamics. When you see faster clearance with some of these drugs, particularly with tirabrutinib compared to ibrutinib, uh, this is important to keep in mind because the clearance of the drug itself 
uh, may also impact uh, the duration of time that BTK inhibition can uh, occur. Now, when you look at you know, drugs for, from a dosing perspective, the shorter half-life of acalabrutinib uh, may also weigh into the fact that this needs to be given uh, twice daily. With zanubrutinib, one does see sustained complete inhibition with more than 95% BTK occupancy in lymph nodes. Uh, this is uh, more so with the 160 BID dosing than 320, although both of these dose, dosing parameters have been shown to be active. But it does show you once again that the dosing frequency is very important. And also to keep in mind that the mean elimination half-life, for instance, with terabrutinib being you know, quite long, uh, means in fact that the drug is gonna linger longer uh, in uh, the patient. Now, these are the IC50s for off-target effects. I think we all recognize that BTK itself is very potently inhibited by all three of these covalent uh, inhibitors. However, there are also other off-target effects would need to be kept in mind because they may also contribute to both the efficacy and toxicity of the drugs. For instance, keep in mind that ITK, which is very important in terms of immune regulation, uh, is inhibited by ibrutinib as well as anibrutinib at pharmacologically achievable levels. However, for acalabrutinib and terabrutinib, you see that the uh, levels of inhibition 50, 50% 50 reduction actually are very, very high. Uh, also keep in mind EGFR. We see a number of toxicities that have been linked to EGFR inhibition, which we'll talk about momentarily. Uh, but you see that there's a lower IC50 for ibrutinib as well as anubrutinib relative to acalabrutinib and terabrutinib. Also important to keep in mind the HER2s, HER2, HER4. Her uh, both of these are important. We'll talk about them momentarily. HER2 in particular may be important uh, for cardiac toxicity. You see, in fact, you know, a lower IC50 with ibrutinib um, and a modest one with zanubrutinib, but much higher with acalabrutinib and terabrutinib. BLK, a very important component of the BCR pathway. You see that ibrutinib can actually shut it down at very low IC50, the same also being true of zanubrutinib relative to the two other next generation BTK inhibitors. So, as I mentioned earlier, some of these targets are actually good if you inhibit them. Keep in mind BLK, it's part of the BCR complex. There's also, for some of these next generation BTK inhibitors, also anti-LIN activity. And this is also part of the BCR pathway. However, what exactly their role is in being able to inhibit BCR uh, may be in some respects speculative since both BLK as well as LIN uh, knockdowns have shown to actually perhaps exaggerate uh, BCR uh, signaling. So one has to keep in mind that even the underlying science still remains to be clarified that if you're inhibiting these other targets, whether you're actually affecting the tumor in a positive way or in a negative way. Now, it also depends on the disease. BCR we know is important for CLL and also for ABC DLBCL uh, signaling. But in the case of um, mid-ED8 mutated tumors, the signaling dynamics are actually quite different. And in fact, HCK, which is a major downstream signaling activator uh, in mid-ED8 mutated lymphomas, can also be differentially affected by BTK inhibitors. In fact, with ibrutinib, you see an IC50 of 49 nanomolars, well within the pharmacological range of this drug. You don't see it with acalabrutinib. You don't see it perhaps with uh, terabrutinib because the kinome uh, dynamics haven't been really elaborated on. But zanubrutinib, on the other hand, can also affect HCK. And in fact, 65% inhibition at one micromolar has also been reported. So perhaps at a higher IC50 than what has been recognized uh, with ibrutinib. And we know from the experiments that have been previously published uh, from our group that you know, HCK may very well be important. When you see, in fact, mutations in HCK that affect the bonding of ibrutinib to HCK, you, in fact, you see greater degree of resistance as opposed to when you mutate BTK itself uh, at the CIS481 site. So I do think it's important to keep in mind that HCK may be very much contributing to the signaling in these mut mutated mid-EDA tumors. Now, there's been a lot of interest also in better trying to understand the off-target effects 
of um, these um, inhibitors on cardiovascular function. You'll be hearing more about this uh, in the subsequent segments. But important to keep in mind that there are a number of off-target toxicities which have been attributed to underlying inhibition of uh, other kinases. This can include, of course, you know, rashes, diarrhea, bleeding, infections, and atrial fibrillation. Now, in terms of the effect on the heart itself, um, one does see that drugs like ibrutinib, a drug like ibrutinib, can infect can affect HER2, HER4, as well as TEC. These are actually uh, potentially important in cardiovascular side effects, whereas acalabrutinib inhibits HER4 and only slightly TEC, but not HER2. Conversely, when you look at zanubrutinib, this uh, seems to affect uh, TEC as well as HER4, but not HER2 whereas tiribrutinib can affect TEC, but neither HER2 or HER4. Her so you see, in fact, that there are differences, and I will get back to this momentarily. But recently, there's also another very exciting paper that has been published. It involves mouse modeling, which has implicated CSK as a mediator of ibrutinib-related atrial fibrillation. This was published in the journal Circulation. And in fact, when mice were treated with ibrutinib and subjected to in vivo cardiac electrophysiology, you see that the mice did develop uh, atrial fibrillation over time compared to control models. Now, looking at differential proteomic expression, in fact, of the uh, cardiac myocytes, one sees, in fact, uh, that CSK, FIN, as well as MEK5 were associated with atrial fibrillation and not per se uh, BTK. And this has actually been further validated in a CSK knockout model that did show uh, atrial fibrillation for the mice that carried the CSK knockout, knockout. So I think this is a very nice exhibition of science that helps uh, cement um, a particular off-target effect uh, associated with atrial fibrillation. This is a beautiful paper that was also recently uh, published uh, by my colleague, Edward Smith, who actually also happened to be one of the discoverers of BTK. And I think it's a very nice uh, summation of the various adverse effects associated with BTK inhibitors and actually looking at the off-target as well as on-target kinase effects, recognizing that infection may be um, differentially impacted by the rate of inhibition of BTK tech as well as ITK that bleeding uh, dynamics may be affected not only by BTK, by TEC as well. And TEC is very potently inhibited by brutinib. That atrial fibrillation, as I mentioned, may be a summation of HER2 and HER4 and possibly TEC inhibition, and particularly maybe HER2 and HER4 combined. But as recent data also shows, CSK, as I mentioned earlier, that epithelial cell injury in the form of rash may in fact be affected by EGFR. And you can see in fact that for ibrutinib and zanubrutinib, there is this inhibitory effect. But keep in mind that with terabrutinib on the other hand, where one sees um, very little EGFR inhibition, rashes were appreciated up to 40% uh, of patients. And there are other um, injuries which still remain to be clarified that may involve BMX and JAK3 uh, that I think in due time will be further elaborated on. So in summary, notable differences in PK, PD, and off-target effects are evident with covalent BTK inhibitors currently in clinical practice in the U.S. as well as other places. Differences in PK dynamics, which can impact drug activity for covalent BTK inhibitors include CMAX, the area under the curve, half-life, as well as clearance dynamics. Off-target effects can contribute to BTK inhibitory activity and may be B-cell malignancy specific, for instance, inhibiting components of the BCR signaling pathways such as BLK and HCK for mid-88-driven lymphomas. And also to keep in mind that differential adverse effects of BTK inhibitors appear to be related to off-target effects, which can include TEC, HER2, EGFR, uh, as well as CSK. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to this segment of the Medscape program on mechanisms of actions for BTK inhibitors. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I'm Paolo Ghia from Milano, where I'm directing the research program on chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Today, I will be discussing with you the case for outcome. So I will be discussing the next generation BTKI and their evidence in terms of efficacy, 
providing deep and durable responses. So uh, we know that the BTKI has become one of the pillar of, of treatment for B cell lymphoid malignancies. And in particular, uh, it's shown most of the efficacy in uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, we are referring to ibrutinib, the uh, first uh, BTKI that arrived uh, on the market. And uh, here you can see the results that uh, have been obtained in the relapsed refractory setting, the resonate study, in the resonate 2 in first line uh, setting, and also in combination with the chemoimmunotherapy, bendamastin plus rituximab, and in any case, uh, demonstrated always superiority in terms of PFS compared to the comparators. But ibrutinib has been uh, has shown also efficacy in uh, many other B cell malignancies in the relapsed refractory setting. So besides CLL in the resonate 2, uh, in the resonate study as mentioned, also in the Waldenstrom disease, marginal zone lymphoma, and mantle cell lymphoma, as you can see in this table. Uh, the next generation uh, BTKI, as uh, previously described, uh, are um, constituted by zanobrutinib and acalabrutinib. And here I show you zanobrutinib and the data in terms of progression-free survival in various B cell malignancies. Again, Waldenstrom marginal zone lymphomas and mantle cell lymphoma where indeed also this molecule demonstrated durable responses. In, in particular, xanobrutin in the phase one in patients with CLL uh, showed uh, efficacy in both treatment-naive patients and the relapsed refractory patients, as you can see here, with a median follow-up uh, uh, of around uh, um, two and a half years, uh, 32 months for the treatment-naive patient, uh, and 23, almost two uh, years for the relapsed refractory patient. And in this case, you can see that the 24 month progression free survival was uh, uh, very impressive 95% among the um, treatment naive patient. And of course, as expected, a little bit less 91% in the relapsed refractory setting. What is also interesting is that it is that in the treatment naive patient, uh, we uh, witness 100% of uh, overall response. Uh, in, uh, in patients with CL. Tanobrutin we showed efficacy also in a relapsed refractory uh, setting in uh, other B cell malignancies. And you see here the data for uh, Waldenstrom disease, uh, marginal zone lymphoma, and mantle cell lymphoma again. So now we move to acalabrutinib, the other uh, next generation BTK inhibitor. And uh, again, also this molecule has been tested in a variety of B cell lymphoid malignancies, in particular CLL in the ASCEND study, where acalabrutin monotherapy was compared to uh, a physician choice between uh, bendamastin plus rituximab or idelazvi plus rituximab. And here, with uh, um, a media follow up of around two years, uh, um, the media and progression free survival was not yet reached. It has been also tested in Waldenstrom disease. And here you can see uh, both treatment naive and relapsed refractory patients who have been treated with this molecule. And the 24 month progression free survival was uh, again, very impressive, 90% among the treatment naive patients. And again, a little bit less as expected in the relapsed refractory patients. And finally, in mantle cell lymphoma, median progression free survival of 22 months with an estimated 36 month progression free survival of 37%. So roughly one third of the patients still responding. And here there is a summary where uh, we show the efficacy in all these uh, uh, three different diseases, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, Waldenstrom disease, and mantle cell uh, lymphoma. But the, the important thing and important achievement is that these molecules have been compared to the uh, first BTK inhibitor, ibrutinib. So now we have uh, the Aspen study comparing zanobrutinib to ibrutinib in the context of patients with uh, uh, Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. And, uh, and the primary endpoint was the rate of complete responses or very good partial responses. And indeed, uh, though uh, um, it, uh, the primary endpoint has not been reached because uh, uh, statistic, there was no statistical significant difference between uh, uh, the, the values uh, reached uh, with zanobrutin uh, uh, 28% of complete responses and very good partial responses compared to 19% with ibrutinib, still the difference uh, is uh, rather important. And if we look at the investigator assess rates of uh, uh, VGPR and CR, then uh, there there is a statistically significant difference. 
Um, and the other study that uh, compared xanobrutin versus ibrutin was the patient, uh, uh, was the study with the enrolling patient with the relapsed refractory patient with CLA. And uh, here, uh, the data are uh, probably more impressive. Uh, we have a short follow-up of only 15 months, but there we can already uh, see that the overall response was significantly better in, um, with zanobrutinib uh, being uh, almost 80%, 78.3, compared to ibrutinib 62.5%. Um, in this case, the overall response uh, included only partial responses and complete responses, and the, the partial responses with lymphocytosis were excluded. If we consider also the partial responses with uh, lymphocytosis, then the numbers are uh, a little bit more similar, but still with danobrutin, we have uh, um, many more, uh, um, much higher frequency of overall response, 88%, almost nine out of 10 patients responding compared to 81.3 in the case of uh, ibrutinib. What is also more interesting with a 12 month landmark uh, uh, analysis, uh, we can see already a significant difference in terms of progression free survival between zanobrutinib and ibrutinib, with 94, almost 95% of patients treated with zanobrutinib is still responding compared to 84% of those treated with ibrutinib. And then finally, we have the data from the Elevate RR relapse refractory where acalabrutinib was compared to ibrutinib, again, in the context of relapse refractory patient, in particular patient with high risk disease, carrying either deletion 17P or uh, deletion 11Q. In this case, the, the, it was a non-inferiority study, so the efficacy here was uh, uh, absolutely ident identical, superimposable, and that was actually the primary endpoint of the study. As you can see here, in terms of PFS, uh, um, they had the, uh, both drugs, they had a median PFS of exactly 38.4 months with a, a, another ratio of 1.00. And in fact, this study, the, the, the highest value of this study is in terms of safety. And you will be seeing and talking about this uh, in, the, uh, in another presentation by Dr. Tan. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I hope this presentation has been useful for you. Thank you very much. I'm Con Tam from Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and University of Melbourne, and I will present data on next, next generation BDK inhibitors and their reduced side effect profile. As an introduction, the next generation BDK inhibitors, Zanabrutinib and Acalabrutinib, are more specific in, its, in BDK inhibition compared with Ibrutinib, with reduced off target. Uh, inhibition of other kinases, which means there may be a potential for reduced side effects. These drugs are now used in a variety of clinical settings for B-cell benignancies, and sometimes in single arm studies, it can be hard to dissect out the adverse events caused by the drug compared with the uh, effects of the disease itself. We now have three studies uh, which compared these drugs head-to-head -head with ibrutinib and I will present the toxicity data in this presentation. Ibrutinib has been shown to have a very consistent safety profile across a range of diseases. Shown here are the adverse events reported in CLL, in Waldenstrom's macrocarbonemia, but similar adverse events have been reported in ibrutinib, uh, studies of ibrutinib in other histologies. The most common adverse events of BDK inhibition and ibrutinib are bleeding due to platelet dysfunction, as well as cardiovascular toxicity, including hypertension and atrial fibrillation. This slide summarizes the cardiovascular toxicities of ibrutinib. Across a different type, um, you can see on the left that across a different range of B cell malignancies and different studies, that the range of the risk of atrial fibrillation with ibrutinib ranges from approximately 5% to approximately 15%. Hypertension, especially grade three hypertension, occurs in approximately 10 to 15% of patients and tended to occur late in the course of treatment, usually occurring beyond one year of therapy. In addition, we know that ibrutinib is associated with an increased risk of bleeding and my group and also my colleagues in France discovered that this Platelet this bleeding uh, uh, tendency was due to a platelet defect. 
This is a, one of my patients, and this is his platelet function study showing that uh, when he takes ibrutinib, that there's a reduced activation of platelets from collagen exposure. And this is a very re reproducible finding across uh, uh, all patients treated with ibrutinib and is reversible on drug cessation and regeneration of the platelets. Understanding that ibrutinib is, an anti, is a potent antiplatelet drug is also useful in managing bleeding. Uh, the most severe bleeding in my experience occur in patients who take multiple antiplatelet agents. And in particular, I give the illustration of one of my patients here who is at the time of starting ibrutinib was also taking aspirin and clopidogrel. Therefore, this gentleman was on three separate antiplatelet drugs and he developed a very rare problem of recurrent Palmer hematoma. Once we realized that he was taking three different antiplatelet drugs, we stopped his clopidogrel and there were no further recurrence of his bleeding. On to this, the next generation BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib. This um, shown here are the tarnum uh, inhibition profile of the three drugs with ibrutinib on the left, acalabrutinib in the middle, and zanabrutinib on the right. You can see that compared to the first generation drug, ibrutinib, both acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib shows a more targeted uh, uh, tarnum inhibition profile with less targeting of enzymes which are related to BTK. This in turn gives a potential for reduced side effects. As I mentioned before, ibrutinib is associated with a risk of bleeding as well as cardiovascular side effects, as well as an increased risk of diarrhea and rash, likely due to EGFR inhibition. Both acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib have a reduced risk of bleeding and cardiovascular side effects and a reduced uh, risk of diarrhea and rash occurrence. The Elevate RR study is a direct head-to-head -head phase three comparison of ibrutinib versus acalabrutinib in relapse refractory COL. Patients receiving acalabrutinib had reduced adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation. And importantly, in the adverse events, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and bleeding events, which as I mentioned, were the major bleeding problems, the major side effects of ibrutinib were reduced in patients taking acalabrutinib. Shown here graphically are the occurrence of atrial fibrillation and hypertension over time. And you can see that the risk of acalabrutinib is much lower than that of ibrutinib. Similarly, bleeding events and diarrhea and arthralgia are all less common with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. The Alpine study is the second head-to-head -head phase three study comparing a next generation drug with ibrutinib. And in this case, it was the drug zanabrutinib compared with ibrutinib in patients with relapsed refractory COL. In totally co total concordance with the previous study, uh, in this study, the next generation drug zanabrutinib was also associated with a reduced risk of atrial fibrillation and flutter, as well as reduced adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation or death due to adverse events. Shown here graphically is the reduced risk of atrial fibrillation in patients taking zanabrutinib on the Alpine study. Finally, we have a third head-to-head -head study. This is the Aspen study of zanabrutinib versus ibrutinib in patients taking in patients with Waldenstrom's macrobobinemia. In this study, zanabrutinib was associated with a reduced risk of atrial fibrillation and flutter from 15.3% in ibrutinib to 2% in zanabrutinib, as well as a reduced risk of diarrhea, hemorrhage, and major uh, and severe hypertension. Zanabrutinib was associated with an increased risk of neutropenia, but this did not result in an increased risk of infection. Shown here graphically is the, uh, the curves showing a reduced risk of atrial fibrillation and flutter with zanabrutinib in red, compared to ibrutinib in blue, and on the right, a reduced risk of hypertension. In conclusion, the next generation drugs, zanabrutinib and acalabrutinib, are more specific BDK inhibitors, which then provide opportunity for reduced off-target adverse events, 
compared to the first generation drug, ibrutinib. And in particular, uh, then there are now three head-to-head -head studies of, a, of ibrutinib versus a next generation drug. And all of these studies are concordant in showing a reduced risk of atrial fibrillation and flutter and a reduced risk of severe hypertension with the next generation drug. Therefore, the next generation drugs are, are, are have a more favorable uh, uh, adverse event profile compared to ibrutinib in clinical use. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Alessandra Tedeschi. I am medical director in the division of hematology of Niwarda Hospital in Milan. And I am in charge of uh, lymphoproliferative disorders program with a special interest in uh, CLL, marginal zone lymphoma, and uh, Waldstrom. Um, the topic is the case of usability and the convenience in uh, BTK inhibitors. BTK inhibitors are gaining a widespread use in the treatment of uh, lymphoproliferative disorders. All three agents are administered orally and therefore can be easily given in the outpatient setting. According to their pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, they have different dosages approval. Ibrutinib is administered once daily at the dosage of 420 milligrams or 560 milligrams according to the disease. Zanabrutinib, which is the one with the better pharmacokinetics, is approved both once or twice daily, while acalabrutinib is recommended at the dosage of 100 milligrams twice daily. Polypharmacy is externally common in patients with lymphoproliferative disorders, mainly due to the treatment of comorbid condition in the elderly population. Considering that the metabolism of BTK inhibitors is largely mediated through the CYP3A pathway, which also plays a prominent role in the metabolism of numerous other uh, uh, agents, drug-drug interactions should be carefully considered. In general, medications that are strong inducers of CYP3A4 should be avoided during BTK treatment as a use may translate in a lack of efficacy. Clinicians are reminded that CYP3A4 induction is not limited to prescription products only. Some complementary medications, including St. John's Worth, are also strong inducers of CYP3A4. At the same time, strong inhibitors should be avoided because these agents may markedly increase the potential adverse effects associated with increased ibrutinib and acalabrutinib exposure. For the same reason, zanobrutinib dosage may be reduced when using strong inhibitors. Should be remembered that grapefruit, grapefruit and severe oranges may contain the strong or moderate inhibitors of CYP3A, so should be avoided during treatment. Ibrutinib may also increase the concentration of PGP on BCRT substrate with a narrow therapeutic index like digoxin. In the prescribing information, we can easily find the indication on when BTK inhibitors should be avoided or how the dosages should be adjusted according to the power of inducers and emitters of CYP3A4. Formal medication review is important in all patients treated with BTK inhibitors before and during treatment. This is demonstrated in this study of patients treated outside clinical trials. In two thirds of patients, ibrutinib dose adjustment due to a potential drug-drug interaction allowed to maintain patients in treatment with no significant difference in the rate of the BTK inhibitor discontinuation and this translates in a similar progression for survival. Acalabrutinib solubility decreases with increasing pH, resulting in decreased plasma levels. This is the reason why proton pump inhibitors should be avoided during acalabrutinib treatment, and anti-acid or H2 receptor antagonist should be given after two hours from acalabrutinib administration. In general, all BTK inhibitors may increase the risk of bleeding, and this is the reason why a medical review of anticoagulant and antiplatelets should be carefully performed during treatment. 
The area under the curve of BTK inhibitors increases in patients with hepatic impairment. So to avoid an increase in toxicity, attention should be applied to these patients. In patients with severe hepatic impairment, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib should be avoided. While zanabrutinib may be given at the lower dosage of 80 milligrams. In front of the patients with a moderate or mild hepatic impairment, imbrutinib dosages should be reduced, while those modifications are not required while in treatment with zanabrutinib or acalabrutinib. As a general rule, those descalations at the onset of grade 3 or 4 toxicity should apply at all the next generation BTK inhibitors with some differences. For example, here we have what we should do with ibrutinib. At the onset of grade three and four hematological and extrahematological toxicity, or grade three neutropenia with fever and infection with ibrutinib, the first action should be drug interruption until recovery. In case of grade three or four recurrence at the same episode, a dose escalation should be performed. The drug should be discontinued at the onset of the fourth episode. Zanobrutinib should be discontinued in the case of three, four non hematological toxicity. In this case, neutropenia is distinguished in grade three with fever or four, grade four, lasting more than 10 days, while thrombocytopenia, grade three with bleeding, or grade four, again, lasting more than 10 days. Even with acalabrutinib, we should descalate the dosages according to grade 3, 4 hematological and non hematological toxicity. In this case, when we focus on hematological toxicity, the derivation of neutropenia and the presence or not of breathing should be considered. The favorable tolerance of BTK inhibitor treatment should translate in a better quality of life. Aspen is the first study comparing the quality of life between two BTK inhibitors. It is a randomized study in Waldestrom of zanobrutinib versus ibrutinib. Both drugs ameliorate patients' quality of life with a greater trend of zanobrutinib. And this was true in most of the subscale analyzed. And we have here an example on the subscale of diarrhea. This relevant point regarding patients' derailing disease-related symptoms and quality of life will be also analyzed in other randomized studies comparing BTK inhibitors in the elevated RR, acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib in relapsed refractory CLL, and the alpine study, zanobrutinib versus ibrutinib in patients with CLL. So hello everybody again. Uh, my name is Christian Buske. I'm medical director at the University Hospital Ulm, heading the Institute of Experimental Cancer Research. And it's now time for the closing statement of our program, continuing to build a bright future for our patients. So which key takeaways do we have? I think what we can state is that with the availability of more specific BTK inhibitors, we have the chance to personalize treatment in patients taking individual comorbidities into account. I think this is a major advantage which we have now. To use BTK inhibitors with less off-target adverse effects, as we know, we are dealing with indolent lymphomas and uh, quality of life is very, very important in our patients. And I think it's a very uh, uh, relevant issue that uh, these BTK inhibitors have less off-target adverse effects. We are able as I said, to personalize treatment. So to prefer acalabrutinib and zanobrutinib in case of cardiac comorbidities or pre-existing hypertension. And we have the chance to induce deeper remissions in patients with Wildstrom's macroglobulinemia and higher response rates and potentially prolonged progression-free survival in patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So what is the future of next-generation PTK inhibitors? I think uh, what we can say is that next generation BTK inhibitors will further change the treatment landscape in the non Hodgkin lymphomas. We talked about Weisenströms, macroglobulinemia, CLL, mental cell lymphoma, or marginal zone lymphoma. I'm quite sure that they will serve as one of the backbones of treatment in BTK sensitive B non Hodgkin lymphomas also in the future. They will allow wider use based on the reduced off target effects and better tolerability. 
And in particular situations, such as, for instance, MIDI-88 wild-type Bidenstrom macrolemia patients, they have high activity as shown for zonalbrutinib, which means that you will have alternatives to immunochemotherapy in patient subgroups, uh, former being difficult to treat uh, with um, ibotinib. However, the major challenge will be to determine the optimal combination partners, because as strong as these next generation BTK inhibitors are, I think they will exert their full potential in combination with other potent uh, drugs. So the major challenge will be to find or define these optimal combination partners for highest efficacy for developing treatment concept, concepts with fixed duration application. I think this will be very important as we don't have to give uh, these PTK inhibitors in a non-fixed duration uh, schedule. And we should achieve all of this without increasing toxicity and losing feasibility, which is so important in these diseases with a chronic indolent cause. So with this, um, I want to conclude. I want to thank you for participating in this activity. I hope you, you learned a lot. And please help us and proceed to answer the post-activity assessment questions and take a moment to complete the program evaluation. So we are depending on you to improve these activities, these educational events more and more. Thanks a lot. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.